right, uh, we have a special presentation this evening. We have with us Pedro Lopez from the uh, SQL Server team in Redmond, Washington. Uh, he is a program manager in the database systems group. I met Pedro when he was working with the uh, SQL DB uh, driver group, and uh, he was the one that brought it back from the dev 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 mall. Uh, now we're uh, we've got a good old ADB driver, uh, and uh, he has since moved on and got promoted to program manager in database systems. He has over 19 years of industry experience. You know, Microsoft for nine. Uh, he's currently responsible for that program management, like I said, the database engine. So this is somebody who knows the database engine quite well. Uh, and for SQL Server and Azure, uh, with special focus on the relational engine. He's a regular speaker, a number of speaker on number of conferences and user group events. He blogs all about about SQL at uh, SQL Server Team blog, and we'll put the link there uh, in the comments. He's also the author of the Learn T SQL Query book, which I've Seen has got great reviews, by the way, Pedro. Appreciate that. Congrats on that on that book. He's also authored several tools in a Tiger toolbox on GitHub, and DP um, check script for SQL best practices and performance checks. A whole series of tools. I'm going to be copying this in the comments so you guys can go grab these tools, check out his book. Pedro, welcome to the meeting. Hey, Juan. Thank you. Welcome, uh, everyone. Um, just just a, a couple of comments on what you said. Thank you for the for the intro. It's uh, um, um, I, I I did bring back OLEDB from the dead, as you mentioned. Um, that was a a let's say an uh, extended project for me. Um, I I have been for around five years now the program manager for a relational engine in SQL Server. So that means that. The part of the, um, the part of SQL Server that uh, in, uh, that includes the query processor and the query execution engine, and and that was kind of a side project for me uh, because I had I had a vested interest in making sure that OLEDB uh, rose again from the dead because for many many years I've been in the field and that was a pain I recurrently saw. Um, I am, however, not um, very well versed in the uh, jet engine that that's used by Access, uh, so I apologize <laughs> for not being very proficient at that because I know it's the one of the main focuses of this this user group here. Now, yeah, I mean the group is about SQL Server with Access, so this is quite relevant for us because you know a lot of times Access developers are not SQL Server experts. I always start my presentations. As I'm not a SQL Server expert, I'm an expert in access with SQL Server. So any okay. intimate knowledge that we gain to this presentation, we appreciate, especially when it comes to the latest on SQL Server 2019. By the way, if you have any questions for, for Pedro, I'm monitoring the chat window, and uh, I will let him know of your questions as the progress presentation progresses. Okay. So um, as we approach a, a new release for SQL Server in, in on-premises, which is SQL Server 2019, um, we, we are debuting a, a, a number of features that uh, roll into a concept that we call the Intelligent Database. Uh, and that's essentially what I'm going to talk about today. Now, um, the let me just kick off here. Okay, so the Intelligent Database uh, sits on a premise, and the premise is that the SQL Server engine, which powers both both SQL Server and uh, Azure SQL DB, it's literally the same engine, uh, needs to adapt to the constantly changing world of businesses and data. And that's a, a, a very uh, encompassing uh, aspiration here. Now, it sits on mainly four pillars uh, that, that we've identified. One is... We don't see your presentation, by the way. Don't? Oh, my God. Okay. So what happened here? I was sharing the screen. Share. It stopped sharing my screen. Oh shoot. Okay. Screen one again. We see the SQL Server Management Studio. And, and now we see your uh, your Great. Thank okay. You. So resetting. As I was saying, so this is this is a very uh, uh, all encompassing uh, premise that you have here for intelligent database, and it sits on a few different pillars. One being to provide anxiety-free upgrades. Now, this means, uh, in essence, that uh, we want to provide a way for the engine to, or for the customers, I'm sorry, to have no regressions 
when they upgrade to a new version of SQL Server. So whether you're upgrading to a new version or actually moving from on-premises to Azure SQL Database, the, um, the intent is that a customer will experience zero regressions in, in what relates to query performance. Why? Because, first of all, all the uh, feed query plan affecting features that we have poured into the engine in the last few years are gated. Are gated by this concept called the database compatibility level. In that sense, if a customer moves uh, a current database to either the cloud or a new version of SQL Server and maintains the same database compat level as it did in the source system, let's say upgrading from SQL 2008, which just fell out of support, into a newer version, maintaining the DB compat level means that we, we, we protect against plan changes and therefore all else being equal, we, we, we don't change the plans and therefore you have a sense of predictable performance. Now, I did say all else being equal because obviously if you move for, to a server that has more or less uh, uh, um, resources, then obviously that will affect performance either positively or negatively. But the point is it will affect performance not because of the engine changes that we've poured into, into, into our relational engine, but rather because of the ecosystem. That means the machine where it's running. So, like I said, all else being equal, we, we will maintain the query performance as, as it, well as it performed in the source system. Now, we have a, new, uh, a few other uh, technologies that, that will assist to that. For example, automatic plan regression correction, in the sense that during, during the normal operation of a server, if there happens to be a recompilation of a query, and it actually uh, uh, turns out having worse performance than it did before, we will detect that regression and we will uh, automatically um, go back to the last known good plan that didn't uh, have this performance inefficiency. And obviously we also have another tool called Query Tuning Assistant that will allow us to, in the scope of an upgrade, um, identify potential um, query issues that fall outside the, the normal uh, models that we have for the query optimizer, identify those and help you tune uh, those queries uh, in, a, in an automated process. The other pillar, which is where I'm going to talk about mainly today, um, has to do with um, intelligent performance, as Bob Ward usually calls it. Now, this is a sense of having workload performance being extremely consistent and predictable. That means that consistency needs to be ironclad, needs to be shielded either on the same system or across comparable offerings, either on premises, so newer SQL Server versions, or on Azure SQL VM or Azure SQL Database. Now, the other premise is that there's no need for to have a rocket scientist uh, running the data platform because advanced performance tuning skills are not required in this context. context. So you can provide, or provision, sorry, a number of databases in SQL Server 2019, in Azure SQL Database, without having to tune a single query or turn a single knob because the premise of intelligent query processing, which is at the top there, is that it just works. And I'm going to show a number of those features today. Um, we, we do have other, other uh, features that will take your database workloads to their peak performance. For example, another family of features we call in-memory databases. That includes hybrid buffer pool, memory optimized MTB, um, in-memory LTP tables that, that have been there since SQL 2016, and PMEM support. Now, uh, all those together with intelligent query processing will allow you to have sub-millisecond response time from your application. But also part of the intelligent database is to have management by default. So if the customer doesn't have a DBA, we can potentially cover most or all the tasks that are needed, from index hygiene to integrity checks to flexible scale. So, um, for example, we, can, we have automatic indexing in Azure, Azure SQL database. That is not in SQL Server in the box yet, but uh, it, it's something that is differentiating in SQL ad, the database right now. So the ability for us to um, detect potentially missing indexes, apply those indexes, uh, monitor performance on whether those indexes had a positive effect on the system or not. If they did, great. If they didn't, we will roll back that, in, that, that uh, deployment. And we keep iterating through this. But... Um, for example, in Azure SQL Database, you can vertically scale up, uh, for example, using Azure Automated Runbooks, or even scale out, like you, using data sharding, for example, 
um, and and that we do automatically uh, for you behind the scenes. The user just just has to uh, slide uh, uh, literally a slider in the Azure portal. So there are a lot of automations that we are embedding into into the engine or um, around around uh, the SQL Server engine that will allow us to have uh, automatic management or easy management by default, such as for for example accelerated database recovery, the ability to um, recover from to actually run database recovery in seconds rather than pot potentially minutes or hours. Um, we actually have customers trying this out, and 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 they've gone, for example, a long running process that goes above the SLA, for example, and usually when they have to cancel the process, uh, it will take on average four to five hours to roll back. Well, right now it takes two seconds. So it really is about building intelligence and, and ease of management into the engine that also builds upon, upon these, these uh, principles. And finally, security, also part of Intelligent Database, which, uh, on which we are also building uh, security features that will continually protect databases and workloads and, and never stop evolving. For example, the SQL Advanced Threat Protection uh, includes actually three uh, different intelligent capabilities. With data classification, you're able to classify data in your database, and literally tag which columns on which tables have uh, sensitive data like social security numbers or, or bank accounts, and then use that information to drive your security policies. Or, for example, we have vulnerability assessment, the ability to discover and, and track and even remediate some security misconfigurations that, that you may have in the databases. And, and last but not least, uh, threat detection, the ability that we have, in this case in Azure, uh, to, to detect SQL injection attacks or SQL injection vulnerabilities and even unauthorized storage user account usages so that um, you get actual information, I, and I do get that information quite often because some of my colleagues make an authorized storage, <laughs> make an authorized usage of my storage account. Uh, but the point is, it just works. You do get information that is very um, that is very useful for for maintaining your ecosystem in a very intelligent way. So all of these pillars, all of these features put together that we keep evolving on make up our intelligent database story. So the point is for, for, for a business to focus on the business and leave the rest to us. But today I'm going to talk about... Are these, uh, are these features already live with Azure SQL database? So if I procure a SQL database in Azure, I'll get these? Everything that I've talked, that, that you saw listed here exists today. Yes. Everything. So, uh, and so if a client wanted these on-premise, they would have to buy SQL Server 2019. Uh, not all of these are in, in, in SQL 2019. For example, I did mention automatic indexing is not 2019. It's only in Azure. Uh, the, the threat detection is not in SQL Server 2019. It's in Azure. But everything, that we, that everything else that you see on the screen here is actually in SQL Server 2019. Right, so I'm going to focus on the intelligent query processing. Um, and, and the principles that we have with intelligent query processing are that it needs to be available by default on the latest compat level, um, that it needs to deliver broad impact on your workloads, and, and so improve the performance of the workloads with minimal to no implementation effort, meaning the intent is for you to either do no code changes or very small code changes, and that your critical workloads that run in parallel will just improve when you have to throw more throw more uh, uh, users at that. So meaning at scale, it just runs better while still remaining adaptive to running conditions. So we have a number of, of um, features that today in SQL 2019 make up our intelligent query processing um, uh, story. And what you see in bold here is uh, our features that we've introduced in SQL 2019, and features that are not in bold were already part of SQL Server 2017. Now, I do have an asterisk there in approximate query processing, and I'm going to explain more in detail what that is later uh, in this session. But I just want to mention that that is a single one that is not gated by the DB compat level that I mentioned before, and that's simply because it is literally a T SQL, a new T SQL notation. So new language doesn't get gated by DB Compat. The other features, however, that act upon 
existing code potentially and therefore may potentially change the plan hopefully for the better but you never know those are gated by db compat so that also means that to unlock these features that you see here apart from approximate qp you actually need to move a database from an older compat level to the latest compat level otherwise you are as you should running uh, uh with with the same uh, rules and regulations if you will of your source system that's what removes the risk from upgrades but then at a later point in time you want to start leveraging these features you need to test your application to then um uh, um, certify it to the latest compat level okay so let's uh start by looking at the some of the features that we saw here the first and i would like to to talk about is memory grant feedback now memory grant feedback is available in these two compat levels you see on on the top right hand of the screen there 140 compat level and 150 compat level now there's a difference though memory grant feedback let's just define what it is it's the ability for uh, the engine to detect how much memory a given query has used when it was executing. And then with that feedback about the, the memory grant that, that that query took, take it back to, to, to the engine and understand did we use too much memory and we didn't need it? Or didn't we have memory enough and we, for example, we spilt into TempDB and therefore we need more memory? And then consecutively start adjusting that to have an optimal memory memory usage. Now, in in um, in the case we take either spills to this because we didn't have enough memory, or we take too much memory because and that causes uh, um, concurrency issues. Those are all based on potentially poor cardinality estimations, and that's because when the when the SQL Server engine um, be, optimizes the query together with that information it already tries to determine or estimate how much memory will the system require to actually run this query to produce our result set now if that estimation is poor either by uh, default or excess then that hurts the system memory missed estimations so estimating too few memory will result in spills and that obviously brings in io and slows down the query Overestimations will hurt concurrency because think of a system that has just just give it round numbers 10 gigs of ram or 10 gigs of of memory in sql server and let's think that uh, you are running queries that uh the system estimates will will need one gigabyte each to execute now that means that at most you can run 10 of these queries if nine or ten of these queries uh, at the same time but now imagine that because of overestimation while the sql server engine takes that one gig to execute the query it actually so it, it literally parks grants that that one gig of memory per query it only actually would need and uses uh 100 megs now that's that's a huge overestimation there if i'm able to actually bring down the actual memory usage to those 100 megs rather than taking one gig for each query suddenly I'm able to run a hundred times more, more a hundred times more queries than I ran before, and that's simply because uh, I'm improving the concurrency of my server. So um, what happens is that memory grant feedback will adjust the memory grants based on this execution feedback from the first execution until a point where it's either stable or we don't get a stable result and we disable. Now, what does this mean? So a new query comes in it starts uh reading the memory grants and and sees if it needs to adjust or not rather than uh, either we are in a scenario where we had perfect estimations and therefore there's nothing to do or we have either misestimated or overestimated in which case the system starts getting that information and starts adjusting let's take an example where we are uh misestimating and, and that results in the spill the system continues to adjust in subsequent executions until it reaches a stable value. So if, reaches, if it reaches a stable value, we're done. So you've achieved optimal memory usage for that query. And in this case that we were facing spills, we no longer have spills. Uh, if, however, um, the, the query, for example, is prone to parameter sensitivity, and, and the, the, depending on the incoming parameter, 
Sometimes we need more memory, sometimes we need less memory, because sometimes you produce a thousand rows and sometimes you produce a million rows. Now, this is not a feature that will help you uh, overcome that parameter sensitivity issue. Because if we detect a lot of oscillation in, in memory usage, we'll just give up and, and disable memory grant feedback for that query. And we'll let you know through an X event that uh, if you want to do something manual with that query, for example, or manually adjust the memory for the query using the max grant percent hint, then you need to do that yourself because we won't do it. Then um, I mentioned the combat modes before, and that's because memory grant feedback will work back in SQL 2017 only for batch mode executions. So in essence, back then, you would need to have a query that, ha that made use of, of column store and therefore ran in batch mode to be able to leverage this memory grant feedback process. In SQL Server 2019, we have also opened this to row mode executions, and that's for queries that run in 150 compat mode. So in essence, what do you have uh, as, as a benefit for this, this uh, feature? Is that you'll remove spills or improve concurrency, but only for repeating queries. So keep that in mind. Memory grant feedback requires a full execution to then learn from it, and a subsequent execution to continue learning from it. So it actually requires a query to complete in order to trigger some uh, adjustment. So this is only for repeating queries. Queries that only run once, or you're only running with recompile, for example. Let's say you added the option recompile hint for every one of, every one of your executions will not leverage memory grant feedback. So uh, let, me, let me run a quick, a quick demo on this. Um, are there any questions, Juan, in the meantime? No. OK. It was a quick question on data sharding, but I, um, I gave him a link to what is data sharding on the web. Got it. Good, good, good. Thank you. So uh, here's my SQL Server 2019. And all these demos, by the way, are already online if you want to use them. So you just have to go to this URL here, aka.mswec IQP demos. If you want to learn more about all the features that we've learned that we've that we're going to talk about today, there's also this short URL that takes you to the right place in the documentation, which can be a little tricky to navigate. So I just we just created these short links for you. It's IQP, not IOP. So intelligent query processing. Um, so I'm going to use the Wide World Importers Data Warehouse uh, database here. I'm going to just make sure it's set at 150 compatible level, so because I want to make sure I use the feature. And I'm going to simulate an out-of-date uh, statistics scenario here, so just uh, bear with me. I'm, I'm faking it, I know, but just for the sake of the demo. And let's run this query here, and let's grab the actual execution plan to see what's happening. So as I run the query the first time, it will probably take a little bit, um, little bit of time because because right now I've just simulated an out-of-date stat, so it's, it has a severe uh, um, misestimation occurring there. So it's already started uh, getting some rows. Usually it takes around a minute or so to run this query in my, in my server. Let's just give it a second, a few more seconds there. Come on. So while that happens, let me just show you. No, sometimes I get uh, emails from Azure saying, we just, we recommend this index for you, performance, at the latest compatibility level, right? That's just something prior to this? Um, if you get that, that's because you've enabled auto-indexing. Um, or if you didn't enable it, you're just getting the recommendations. That has nothing to do with the compat level. That happens on every compat level. This new capability, instead of telling me you can, you can add this index and output performance, it'll go ahead and do that for me automatically? Yes, if you have enabled the feature, yes. It will do that management for you. Something that, for example, folks that used to work with mainframe, uh, they've always uh, pointed out that that was a very useful feature they had in in, 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 in DB2 back in the day, which was the ability for the system to detect missing indexes and add them to, to automatically. So that's just uh, the counterpart of that. Okay, 
So this query executed in 58 section, se seconds. Let's look at the execution plan. I'm going to try to bump this up. Okay. So we have a hash match here. Uh, we can see, by the way, if you use the latest version of SMS, you'll get all these useful information just right, right uh, uh, in line. For example, I see the time it took to run each of the operations. Uh, I also see the number of rows that actually were traversing that operator out of the number of estimated rows. So in this case, because I've, um, I've um, kind of skewed my statistics on purpose, I can see that the estimation for this table scan in hardware history was just one row, but it actually read 3.7 million rows. And then that was joined with, a, with a, the, 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 the index scan on the, on the stock item table, and we use a hash match um, because it was uh, the optimal type of join for a very, very small uh, result set. Turns out that after this, uh, this join is applied, we didn't get just one row as estimated. We got 66,000. And you can also see the time it took to execute these, these operators. Now, another thing I'd like to point out is the, um, this symbol here, the warning symbol. And if, if we see the warning, that means on a hash match, that means that, um, that we've basically hit a spill. And that's what you see right here. So we see that this, uh, this uh, operator spilled to TempTB. So it actually started using IO. It actually wrote 52,000 pages. So if you multiply this by 8 kilobyte pages, that, that's quite some, some IO that was driven by this query. And that's because uh, we only, the, the query was only granted one megabyte of memory. It used almost the entire thing, and then it started spilling. Now, this clearly tells me that um, SQL Server misestimated, and therefore it provided a lot less memory than this query would need, and that's why we spilled. So, if we actually go to the hash match, um, sorry, to the select node, we see a number of useful information here. So we see the memory grant, basically what we saw in the, in the, in the pop-up a minute ago, uh, one megabyte. And we can expand that. And when we see expand this memory grant information, we see some more uh, useful data points. So the grant of memory, again, one, mega, one megabyte. Uh, it didn't wait any time to, to get that one megabyte, so that, that's good. Uh, and there's a new property here about the memory grant feedback. And this will tell you the state of the memory grant feedback. In this case, it didn't do anything. Why? Because it's the first execution of the query. Okay? Remember that we mentioned that this is a learning feature, so therefore it needs more than one execution. And we also see here that we had a maximum of um, two uh, gigabytes of RAM that potentially could be given to the query, although we didn't, we didn't get that, obviously. So what I need to do is I run the query again, and we'll see how the system starts adjusting itself. Oh, another one that I wanted to just just for, for reference. So query time stats, I can see that I've spent 56 seconds uh, executing this query. Okay, and this is measured in the engine, not in the tool. Uh, see this, this metric here, 58 seconds? This is measured in the tool, so in SMS. If you actually look at this information in, in show plan, in the execution plan, these are uh, times measured inside the engine. So you do know that by, just by comparing these, that it wasn't my tool, my, my, my visualization layer that was adding overhead per se, but it was actually inside the engine. So let's run the query again and see what happens in the second, ex second execution. So we already learned from the first execution that uh, we, we spilt and we, took, um, we didn't take enough memory. Now, this execution was only six seconds. If I go and look at the execution plan, I no longer have a, a spill because I no longer have a warning. If I go and look at the memory grant information, look that now I've gotten 625 megabytes of memory and of which um, it actually used almost 500. So it already adjusted to something much better. And you see the state here. Is memory grant feedback adjusted? Yes, it is still adjusting. And it's not reached a, a stable state yet. So subsequent executions would, would happen until we get a stable value. But as you could see right now, from the first to the second ex execution, without changing any piece of my code, the system just corrected itself it avoided a spill starting with the second execution. 
So this is a sort of automation and, and concern we want to remove from the users. Uh, so that uh, a user just has to concern themselves with um, providing code that, that works and the system will, will take care of adjusting itself to the way that the data is laid out. So any, let me just reset the demo. Any question on this? So it's rather cool. Without doing anything, just from one execution to the other, the system detected the, uh, a problem and just automatically corrected itself. So that's in my... Loves your server name, by the way. Lord Sidicus. Lord Sidious. <laughs> yes, I'm... Uh... Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. I'm, uh, I'm a fan. So uh, let's carry on. Another, another big advancement in, in SQL 2019 is the introduction of batch mode on, on, on Rose Store. Now let's just give, get, get a quick history lesson on, on, why, on what is batch mode and, and why, what is, why is it historically connected to column store. These two features, batch mode and column store, have, have come hand in hand since it was in, they were introduced back in SQL 2012. Now, column store indexes were introduced back then to provide a way to access data in a columnar fashion, meaning that we would, for, for queries that will, didn't really limit the number of rows they would, they would retrieve from a, from a table, but rather we worked with full dimension tables that had very large number of records, millions or billions of records, but a query would only use a few columns in what would otherwise be a very large dimension table. For example, so uh, sorry, fact table. So uh, column store indexes were introduced back then in SQL 2012 as a way for queries to be able to access only the data in the columns that they needed. Eventually, running aggregations on those columns, and because uh, those those tables and those data warehouses tended to take a lot of space we wanted to effectively inc increase the, the, and improve the compression over traditional row store. So that's why column store indexes by definition compress data into row groups. And that data is accessible in column format rather than uh, the traditional SQL server, which should be a row format. Now, together with column store indexes, we introduced a new way of executing queries which uh, the traditional way of executing queries was called the row, row mode execution. And we introduced a new batch mode execution back then. Now, while column store indexes were, were, were built to improve the efficiency of IO, batch mode execution was built to improve the subsequent CPU usage of queries that had to read from these large column store indexes. So essentially, this was a mode, an execution mode, built for analytical workloads, and that allowed very efficient uh, um, handling of very large data sets. But like I said, since SQL 2012, when column stores were introduced, these two features walked hand in hand. So there was, there was, but we realized that really there's no need to have these two features uh, tied at the hip, because there are sufficient use cases for batch mode to be very useful on very large indexes, very large tables that no, not necessarily are leveraging column store. So, column store is not always an option. For example, you have um, very large tables, but they are uh, OLTP sensitive workloads. So therefore, um, you would probably be hitting a lot of the Delta store, which is not efficient. And, and on the other hand, running OLTP workloads over a full column store that is built with row groups that hold one million rows in each in each row group, and then you have in each segment, sorry, and then you you would have to crack open a one million row segment in order to retrieve one single value, which is typical for an OLTP workload. That would be very um, very inefficient. So in these scenarios, column store is not a real an option, and people wouldn't create column stores and do just uh, continue living with with row store indexes. Or perhaps, for example, you you have uh, uh, you're tied to a vendor application that that vendor application doesn't support you creating column store, so you're just stuck with uh, um, row store indexes. Or, for example, there are um, for example, column store doesn't allow you to create uh, triggers or or doesn't allow uh, persistent computed columns. 
So maybe for your specific table, large table, column store was not uh, an option simply because of its interoperability limitation. So what we've done is to the, to unlock those analytical processing benefits from from uh, batch mode without having column store indexes. So you can now run batch mode uh, operations on row store. And these are uh, supported on, on, on heaps, on, on, on B3 key indexes. And basically, we, we have not introduced necessarily new uh, batch capable operators. The same ones that used to work on column store um, work in, in uh, row store indexes. Uh, so we leverage basically the same surface area. Now, um, what do we check for here? Not all queries that are running on row store will be eligible to run on batch mode because this is primarily a, a, a type of execution that works well with large data sets and typically with analytical workloads. So a rough initial check will involve looking at the table size or the operators that are used uh, as, as, as defined by the query optimizer. And then we'll look at the estimated cardinalities for, for that, the, those inputs. And then judge, hey, do we have a lot of rows coming in from and from these tables? That makes up a good a good use case to potentially use batch mode there. Or for example, over those large data sets that those large number of rows that I'm retrieving from my uh, row store table, am I now also doing some aggregations, for example? That's another good use case where batch mode really outperforms uh, row mode. So if we have all this combination of 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 um, uh, characteristics that li li lead the engine to believe that we're running a more analytical query, then it will kick in batch mode. So the typical candidates will be uh, analytical queries. You you will define what an analytical query is. Typically, it has a lot of of uh, aggregations and reads a lot of data. Um, but also, the, the, these are all AND conditions, by the way. The workload is CPU bound. For example, um, the, 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 every time you run that query, it really pushes your CPU. So we, we will, th this makes a prime candidate for running in batch mode rather than row mode. And additionally to that, if creating a column store is not an option for you or, or it's just um, you depend on features that are not supported by column store, like I mentioned, then these make up good candidates for you to run batch mode on on row store. Now let me just run a demo to make to, for, to, for me to show you how much this again with no code changes just improves the workloads. So what I have here is so again I'm going to my wide wide world importer ZW database. We have another twenty so minutes, right? Yeah, on time. So I'm going to run this query right here and what it, as you can see it's uh reading from a table and just for you to know that's part of the setup script that i we've shared on github is also uh, creating this object which basically uh, uh enlarges some of the objects in the database um you can see that this table right here has um 29 uh, million records and it takes around uh, six gigs of, of, of uh, data space. So it's, it's a fairly large table. And what you're doing is we're selecting from that table and we're doing some aggregations and we're doing some uh, grouping here. And we also, um, and we're also doing some ordering by those tables. So it's, it's rather a complex query. And based on the number of rows that we have in the table, it can be, and the number of aggregations we have in the query, it can be, uh, uh, it can pass by as a, a analytical query. So I'm going to run this first, uh, and notice that I'm using here a hint that will disallow batch mode because otherwise it would just kick in. So I, because I want to show you here the difference between the traditional mode that this query would run in, for example, SQL 2017 or a lower version, which would be a row mode, and that's because this uh, table right here, as you can see on my screen, uh, only has a non-clustered index and a unique non-clustered index, and that means that there's no column store here. And in SQL 
2017 and earlier versions, you would only leverage batch mode if you had column sort here, which is not the case. Okay. And after this, I'm going to run the same query without that hint. And we're going to see the difference. I'm going to pull the actual execution plan here. Let's run those two queries and see uh, if there are any differences between them. Okay, so let's look at the execution plan here. Now, one thing I want to call out is this. Usually, if you if you look at uh, a number of queries in in any any of your favorite tools to look at the execution plans, you'll notice this percentage here. One thing I want to call out is that this percentage is based on estimated costs. So if I'm looking at an actual plan, this actually tells me nothing. Because look at this. This tells me that the query that didn't run, did, didn't run in batch mode, so in row mode, only takes 51% of the resources, let's say, of uh, the combined execution. Whereas the second query, the one that actually ran in batch mode, uh, it's only slightly cheaper than the, the one above. Is it, though? Let's actually look at hard data here. Let's look, for example, at the query time stats, and we see that this query on the top that ran in row mode, doing all those uh, aggregations, all of that stuff, um, took 63 seconds, actually 64 seconds of CPU time, and the elapsed time was 5.3 seconds. If you look at the other query that ran in batch mode, it actually took three times less CPU time, so only 20 seconds, and five or four times less uh, in terms of, of, of elapsed time, so around 1.6 seconds here. So without doing anything, just by allowing the engine to run all, with its defaults in the latest compact mode, the engine recognized that this query was re reading data from a very large table, was analytical in nature because it had a few, a few aggregations and whatnot, and kicked in batch mode. And that really, really improved the performance of the, of, of the query. So as you can see here, this percentage is actually way off because the query on the bottom, query 2, by running in batch mode, is much cheaper than, the, than the, the previous query. So I just wanted to call this out also that this percentage value is meaningless when you are analyzing actual execution plans. Now also look at the plan itself. It's, it's rather different because, for example, in, in, in the plan that would run only in row mode, you would have to do what? You would have to run the table scan. In this case, we did push down the predicate that that's my where clause. But it still, read, uh, it still read the entire 22 million, ro million rows. And after that, it would, it would apply a partial aggregate to the hash, uh, hash match on, this, um, on the, doing the uh, count and these two sums, right? And then it would sort the data based on my order uh, by uh, statement. And then it would, look at this, it would do the it would again need to aggregate the sums based on the sorting and then finally gather the result to do this compute scatter, which is an implicit conversion, and provide the result set. Now, see how that was even uh, made more efficient by using batch mode. Because batch mode, we push down again the same predicate. But if you look at the uh, hash match here, the hash match uh, is able to calculate all the required aggregations in one shot. So notice that the major difference is that this hash match was only a partial aggregate, and we did the, fi the final aggregate here as a stream aggregate. In the batch mode plan, we were able, actually able to do all the aggregates in one shot using a hash match in a way that's much faster, because look at this. We spent 5.3 seconds running this partial aggregate, and then some more time doing this one, and this one only took 0.1 seconds to run. This is all thanks to running in batch mode, as you see here, rather than running in row mode, as you see in the, in the top plan. So, the we got a quick question here from Ben. Yeah. Um, he wants to know how, why is CPU time um, seconds are bigger than the elapsed time? Is, is it because you have multiple CPUs? Yes, exactly that. It's running, it's running in parallel. 
So well, if you go to, let's go, for example, to this table scan here. Um, if, I, if I expand this uh, actual number of rows, I see that each thread, in this case, I have 12 threads, each ran a part of it, right? So therefore, each of the threads took different time, which is cumulative. See here? I see. So it's exactly now, that. When, uh, when from, a, uh, from an access database crowd, we used to deal with 100,000 row tables. Would, uh, would the system still use batch mode for smaller tables like that? If it detects that you are running a query that is complex enough, for example, introducing aggregation, yeah. and on a table that is, that is uh, even 100,000 rows, yes, it may kick in. Because it has to do not only with the number of rows, it also has to do with how the, what operations the query is driving. Okay, so let's resume the uh, presentation and I'll probably be holding off on more demos because these are the two that I really wanted to show because the re the, these really speak to uh, how the engine just adapts to what we're throwing at it without changing code, it just improves. So um, another, another uh, pain point that uh, SQL Server users have had for many years is the use of uh, multi-statement table value functions. So, um, before uh, SQL Server 2017, um, th this is basically how the, the engine deal dealt with a, a MSTVF. Um, we would guess that 100 rows are coming from that object. And if we are right or close to right, then everything is fine because we'll optimize the plan based on that number. And we got a good plan and it just executes fine. However, if we actually got it wrong, and there are a lot more rows coming out of that um, that object, instead of 100 rows, we have 10,000, or or even more than that. Then obviously the plan that we that we optimized for is not based on good estimations, and therefore we'll have what's perceived as a poor uh, a poor plan. And that's because multi-statement table value functions are objects that only exist at runtime. So. They, they, they traditionally, they are only uh, built and populated at runtime. So therefore, before, at compile time, the engine didn't have any notion of uh, what rows could exist there. So that's why we just guessed. And the guess value was 100 rows. Now, be, after SQL Server 2017, we actually, uh, uh, when we, when we uh, detect there's a MSTVF in the plan, we will halt optimization. We will execute the, the MSTVF, so we'll actually materialize that, that object, read the number of rows from that first execution, then carry on optimizing the, the, the execution plan based on that real number, rather than a guess number of 100. This is what we mean by interleaved execution. We start optimizing, we identify the MSTVF, we will materialize, so we'll interleave optimization with execution, come back to optimization. In this case, let's say we had 500,000 rows in that MSCVF, and then we'll carry on optimizing the rest of the plan based on these half a million rows rather than 100. So the downstream operations will benefit from this improved cardinality estimation and we'll get a better plan. I'm going to skip this demo, but again, all the demos are online. They're all self-paced. You can, you, can, you can run the, the script yourself. You can see the observations by yourself. Uh, all the instructions are there. Another, another important uh, breakthrough has to do with adaptive joins. Now, adaptive joins is something that only runs in batch mode. But now in 2019, we have batch mode running on not only column store, but only row store. So basically, that means that batch mode is available everywhere. Which also means that adaptive joins are available potentially everywhere. Now, what are adaptive joins? Let's think of the problem, the problem statement. If the engine gets poor cardinality estimations, that drives the entire optimization process. And part of the optimization process is to come up with the appropriate join algorithm. So, for example, for table one, inner join table two, we can resolve that with a, a, a hash match with an acid loop, or even a merge join. So the physical join algorithm may vary depending on the, uh, um, the cardinality estimations. Now the point is, after, we, uh, after the engine uh, 
comes up with an execution plan and caches it, that's it. Until it needs to recompile again because perhaps we've updated stats or, or something like that, that's the plan it will run with. Now, if we got poor cardinality estimations, that most likely meant that we are not joining those two tables in the most optimal way. And that's where adaptive join comes in. Because adaptive join will defer the choice of whether to run a hash match or a nested loops join until the join is actually being executed. So in essence, if you look at a plan, you'll actually see a new operator there, which is called adaptive join. And what we do is, as, as, as the inputs of that join, let's say two table scans, are being read, uh, they are uh, getting the rows needed from the tables, and, and, and those make up the build input for the join. Now, as the rows, those rows are traversing, there's a threshold that's dynamic in nature for each join. Uh, that we, if we go above the threshold, that means that nested loops, because typically those are only useful for smaller, smaller uh, number of rows, those are not, if we go above the threshold, then we say, oh, okay, so we have actually more rows than we anticipated. So on the fly, we'll change to hash match rather than carrying on to do a nested loops. If we don't cross that threshold, so if the number of rows is sufficiently uh, low, then that join will execute as an asset loops. Now, this is great on, on two, mainly, there's mainly two, two, two uh, benefits in my mind. One, we don't have to recompile the plan in order to get the appropriate type of join for the number of rows that we're getting from the uh, respective input tables. Because that operation is done at runtime. And because it's done at runtime and it's based on, a, on a, the adaptive threshold, that means that a query that sometimes drives more rows and sometimes drives less rows will never need to be recompiled on a, say, on, of, for the sake of this join because adaptive join will adapt, like the name suggests, to the number of rows that are incoming. So again, it's that principle that the engine will adapt to the conditions of which, or on which it, it's running. In this case, the number of rows may be varying, and we just adapt to that during runtime. So, um, yeah, and this is what I've said before. So, adaptive uh, join will use an asset loop for small inputs, and if we go above that threshold, we detect, uh oh, there's a larger input, we'll just uh, flip to hash match and carry on executing. So, any questions on this? I'm also going to skip to them. Yes. No questions yet. Okay. If we have time in the end, I'll, I'll come back for a demo or two, but I don't think we will. So another, another uh, problem space in SQL Server historically has to do with the use of table variables. So the legacy behavior of table variables is what you see on the screen. And specifically, I want to call out the difference between t table, temporary tables, so tables that exist physically, created physically on TempTV, versus table variables, which also exist on TempTV, but the point is they are not instantiated as physical objects. So that also means that for a physical table, a temporary, sorry, a temporary table, we have uh, the, 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 when, when the optimizer is compiling a, a query that makes use of a temporary table, it's actually, what it actually does is um, it, it will defer the first, the, the getting the cardinality estimation until the first execution of the statement. But for a table variable, a similar problem exists to uh, MSCVS, meaning that the table variable will not exist until runtime. So therefore, if it doesn't exist until runtime, at compile time, the engine doesn't know how many rows would come from that table variable. And therefore, it's another case where you use a magic number, a guesstimation. And, tip, and the, the historically, this value is one. We assume that only one row comes out of that table variable. But again, similar to MSTVFs, if that's not the case, let's say the table variable would hold 1,000 rows or 100,000 rows instead of just one, then obviously the plan uh, is very, very inefficient. So what if... We, for all intents and purposes, we make sure that table variables, from a compilation perspective, they would work much in the same way we do for temporary tables, meaning that um, we will only compile 
uh, when we detect there's a table variable when you compile a statement, we will defer um, uh, the cardinality estimation until we actually need to execute it. Mainly, this means that we will materialize that table variable to derive from there the number of rows that that table, vari that table variable uh, has, and then carry on um, compiling and optimizing the plan. So that means that uh, before, uh, where, you, where you have an exa where you had uh, plans that could go, that could go very bad very quickly if you made use of table variables, now they again adapt to running conditions, and we actually read the number of rows in there and use that actual data, actual number of rows to compile a plan. So that's another major difference. So again, it's a it's a it's a testament of how we. Are, are adapting to the actual requirements of a query, in this case, the actual number of rows, to then come up with a better plan. You know, when it comes to uh, temporary tables and table variables, uh, you know, I always get this uh, question during these sessions is, uh, which one should I go with? Table variable or tempor uh, temporary table? And there's always a lot of discussion about that. When it comes to 2019, what are your thoughts specifically on the, the temporary table versus so um so there's a, there's a few there's a few um there's a few things that come come to mind first of all um one thing that has not changed is that table variables do not hold statistics so let's put it like this if you if you have an interim result set which you need to store uh, in a temporary structure uh and you need to apply a predicate on it let's say you are storing 100,000 rows there but in a batch execution, you have a few queries that make use of that same temporary uh, table, uh, temporary uh, space, let's call it that. And those several queries that make use of that temporary space of the same result set, they use where clauses that will only retrieve a subset of that data, right? So um, if you do that, on a temporary table, you can not only build statistics, but build all sorts of indexes, which means that you can optimize for a type of workload that operates on top of that temporary structure that may not necessarily need to need to read all the rows. Can, uh, uh, and you can ex actually create constraints there and a number of other, uh, other, other aspects. Like, for example, if we detect that stats need to be created, we, the engine will also do that. Table variables can be useful, for example, if you need to um, store that, result, that temporary result set and then you'll need to read it, the bulk of it. You want to just store temporarily and then uh, um, then join that temporary structure with, with some other table, but you have no where clauses. And you know that you will retrieve, for that uh, query result, you need to retrieve the majority, if not all, the rows that you are storing in that temporary structure. Then it would be okay to go with a table variable. Now. This is in SQL 2019, because in SQL 2019, we do have uh, this uh, table variable deferred compilation, so we can infer the number of actual rows in that temporary structure and work with that. Before 2019, where you, we didn't have this, this uh, feature, that means that we would go back to the uh, legacy behavior that we will only see one row in that, in that uh, table variable. Now, this is where it goes south, because if you need to store a large number of rows, let's say more than 100, I would say, then you can't use table variables. Why? Because table variables, having only uh, having the, the, the fixed guesstimation of one, and if you start to use, and if you actually store several hundreds or, or thousands of rows in that temporary structure, then everything in the plan that uses that structure was optimized based on the on the assumption that you only had one row there and now that you have a lot more you may be using the wrong join type you may be using the wrong type of aggregate you may maybe using uh row mode where per perhaps batch mode would be useful so it's it, it all goes south thank you thank you very much so um Approximate query processing. Approximate query processing is a new area that we're exploring for scenarios when 
having an approximate number is good enough. And and this is a actually this approximate count distinct is a new T SQL keyword, a new uh, that that instead of doing a count distinct as you would expect, does an approximate version of that. Now what are the differences? Now this approximate count distinct function will implement uh, will will guarantee up to two percent error rate within a 97 percent probability so a very high percent probability that will get a very uh, a, a, a good enough number now you may ask what are you guys talking about why do why would you need to have an approximate count distinct if i can have an actual count distinct now the benefit is uh for scenarios like big data or think of a a scenario where um i'm uh, i have a dashboard that looks at um rolling data for for let's say a a a railroad system and and the intent of that dashboard is to understand if i have enough uh, trains in the in the in the railroads to account for the number of passengers that are coming through the tourniquets in the the train stations or if i have too many passengers i would need to perhaps deploy more trains Okay, so based uh, a decision, uh, this, this decision can this type of decision can be made on a number that is approximate enough. For example, maybe I don't need to know that one million passengers are waiting right now for a train, but maybe uh, if I know that nine hundred ninety-seven thousand are waiting, that's enough for me to trigger decisions. Actually, more than that, nine hundred ninety-nine thousand and nine hundred and something. Are, are because that's a 97 percent probability um, are good enough for me to trigger some decision now this is a revolving let's think of a revolving uh, uh dashboard that is always going back to the database and doing a select count distinct uh, number of rows from that table and it's doing that every second now on a table that has millions or billions of rows not only does this query run slowly but it also takes a lot of memory, and that will impact other queries that are running on, on the same uh, table. Let's say the same table is inserting and reading data for other purposes, and then this, this nagging query that keeps doing a select count distinct just to get data from my dashboard. And, and it does get the very accurate data, because it's an absolute number, but it impacts my system so much that it, it it starts delaying the other workload so what if we had a way of running these count distincts recurrently every second or something like that with a very low memory footprint and therefore without impacting uh, um, without impacting other other uh, workloads the dashboard scenario i mentioned or trend analysis against big data sets um probably i don't need to to have the exact number in order to build my dashboard or to do trend analysis, but I want to maintain the concurrency of my system. So in that case, I want to leverage a query that doesn't use a lot of memory versus a variant that would use a lot of memory. For example, um, data, data science, big data uh, set exploration, now the need to understand over large data distributions, uh, some trends, and the exact values are not really important, but rather the trends that I find there. The only actual, the only, the only scenario where I don't want to use approximate query processing is for banking applications. I certainly don't want ever to know that my bank is using approximate count to know the number of dollars I have in my bank account. I need the actual number. So obviously there are use cases for you to have an approximate count distinct versus the absolute number that you need to get from there. Um, and I think I have time for, I know we were over time, but this one, I think it just speaks for itself. If I'm able to show it, show the, the value of it uh, with a very quick demo. So let me just go back here and open my uh, approximate count distinct demo. Yeah, big data set. How many millions of rows we're talking about? We're talking perhaps billions of rows. Okay. Billions of rows, yes. But maybe not even that, because look at this. Uh, I'm going to use my my uh, the same uh, wide world importers DW database, and for example, this 
history extended, is, uh, order history extended at 22 million rows, if you recall. Mm -hmm. Now, let me do a, a, a count distinct uh, of this, uh, of the order ID uh, column. And I'm going to use this hint to just um, disallow batch mode because I want to isolate the effects of, of, of running an approximate count distinct. Because otherwise, batch mode would kick in and it would offset that, that, that uh, benefit. So I want to remove this just to make sure that we are isolating the behavior of, um, of, of this feature itself. So I'm going to run the query with a select count distinct and then using the new select approximate count distinct. And let's see what happens here. So I'm going to get the actual plan. I kicked off execution there. Okay, so I read 29 million rows here. This, this is a select count distinct. And this one is telling me there are 30.3 million rows. So it's within that 97% uh, probability. And, and let's look at the actual execution plan for both of them. Again, don't really look at this uh, um, here because what I want to focus on is um, the memory that this select distinct took. Now, this select distinct, and imagine that this select distinct would be running every second on my on my on my um, on my table. This used 2.2 gigs of memory. Now, imagine that I had a few dashboards running select distincts over different columns inside the same table, or even other tables. The point is, running these select counts at scale on an average of 2.2 gigs each, just to get a select count distinct. That's really a lot, and that this will certainly hit, a hit, have a severe hit on your concurrency. Now let's look at the approximate count distinct. It took 200 bytes of memory. <laughs> so it is indeed approximate. It's not an absolute count. But for scenarios, like I mentioned before, that you need to do trend analysis, for example, uh, like that, that case of the railroads. It's just a trend. Do I have more passengers? Do I need to put more, more trains in? Do I have less passengers? Do I need to remove trains from the tracks? Uh, it's good enough to drive some decisions. And you can do that at a much larger scale because you don't take up as much resources. So this is the benefit of, of running this uh, uh, select approximate count distinct. It's still good enough to drive decisions. Look at the, the, the like I said, it's a 2% error rate with a 97% probability. So it's still quite on the mark. And this is using, by the way, if you want to read more about it, this is using the hyperlog log algorithm. So there's a, white, there's a paper published by, by, um, by Microsoft Research on this. Uh, it's a, a probabilistic approach to getting, getting row count. Uh, and you see it just works, and it works with let, a lot less resources being used, which is the, the, the main benefit of using approximate, uh, approximate query processing. Okay, so uh, apologies for, for, for taking this long. I have one more feature I want to talk about, which is typically another problem that you've hit in SQL Server, which is the use of user-defined functions, specifically scalar user-defined functions. Now, Several problems exist with this historically. One, those are implemented as a black box in the sense that, okay, you write your, your T sequels, your, your scalar function, and then every time you, you want to use it, you just, you just call that function. And from a developer perspective, this is great because I wrote the code once and I can recall it as many times I want. So they're a very elegant way to achieve that code reuse. However, uh, there are a number of, of computations that are easier to express when, when using uh, um, an imperative form, meaning when I say, um, when I have expressions like select uh, case expressions from a table or, and, or if expressions. Um, those are usually very well expressed within UDFs. And then it's, it's uh, self-contained, and the developer just has to reuse that, that uh, UDF. So it just works very well from a developer's perspective. But then there is a performance perspective. Because every time a query needs to call a scalar UDF, it does so for every single row. For example, if I do a select from a table that has a 1,000 rows, 
and in my select uh, I have this this uh, call to a scalar UDF. That scalar UDF will be executed a thousand times, one per each row that I'm retrieving from the database. Now, base take that plus the fact that because it's essentially a black box for the optimizer, we don't know which, what code is inside the UDF. So what we do, we again do a guesstimation. We use a magic number, and we think that only a hundred rows are coming from that scalar UDF. Where 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 um, Sorry, we, we, that's not what I meant to say, I'm sorry. What I meant to say is um, we run that for each of the thousand executions and whether you have a scalar UDF that's very simple, that only does a small computation, or if you have a number of if clauses inside that then do other data retrievals and other, other sorts of computation, that is all obscured from the optimizer. We never account for that. So we think we have a very simple plan to deal with, but realistically, we have a very complex plan, and we never know. So another, other points of using scalar UDFs, they don't, uh, they don't allow parallelism. Essentially, if you look at any query that today that uses a scalar UDF, you will see that once it comes to executing that UDF, even if the rest of the plan was running in parallel, it will be executed in a serial fashion. Why? Again, we don't know what's inside, so we just assume that's very low cost. We just uh, run that uh, in, in serially. So there are a lot of performance issues with running scalar UDFs, which is why we have come up with this, uh, based again on, on, on work done by our researchers in the Microsoft Research Lab, we have found ways to inline something that's inside the UDF. Now, to deal with the problems that we mentioned uh, a minute ago, typically what the developer will be asked to do is, hey, it's great that you are using scalar uh, functions to reuse your code, but those are introducing performance issues. So please take the code that you have there and put it in line with the sort procedure or whatever whatever uh, code that you're running with, with because then the engine, the, the, the SQL Server engine will be able to optimize the query properly. Well, this was uh, a pain, obviously. So what we've done, again, in the spirit of automating and adapting to, to, um, to the way that workloads uh, run and the way that queries are, are being written, we now will do that for you. So we will actually take, uh, as we parse uh, a new query, we'll detect there's a UDF there. So if we, do, we detect there's a UDF there, we will step out and we will parse that UDF. We will see what operations are being done inside that UDF. And we will then surface those, those um, the call to the UDF in the original query and replace it by the expression that was inside the UDF definition and then carry on uh, uh, optim optimizing the query. This means that, for example, we can take a, a if uh, uh, a very complex if statement that was inside the, the scalar UDF, and we will automatically inline it using a case expression, which is syntactically different but semantically the same, to then be able to optimize with this complexity inlined in the query. That means that the query no longer, that calls the UDF is no longer a black box for the query optimizer. We can actually look at what's inside and then surface the appropriate expression to the optimizer to then um, do an appropriate, an appropriate optimization. So uh, there's a few candidates uh, for, for, for this first version. Any of one, any one of these uh, types of, of UDFs or constructs inside the UDF can be inlined. And there are a number of, the, of constructs that cannot be inlined. For example, a natively compiled swap procedure can't be inlined. Um, if we are using user-defined types, we can't inline that expression because we can't, in turn, go and look to, on, on the definition of the user-defined type. Um, if you are invoking any uh, system functions like get date or new sequential ID, um, we can't inline that uh, because 
get date at compile time is different from get date ex execution time. So there's a few constructs that we can't inline because they would affect the results themselves. So um, how can you see if a, if a scalar UDF that you've created is inlineable or not? There's this new column in, the, uh, in this DMV, the SQL modules catalog view. And if it shows a one, that means that that uh, UDF is capable of being inlined if for, and, and we can read the constructs inside. If it shows a zero, then obviously it's, it can't. Let's say you only use get dates inside that, that or you have some construct, construct that uses uh, any of these uh, non, non in, inlineable constructs. Then we will mark it with a zero because we can't do anything. Uh, if a scalar UDF is inlineable, it doesn't always imply that it will be inlined. We actually have a few cases of that that, that are very, fairly easy to show. For example, um, SQL Server will crack open that UDF, and let's say that depending on the incoming parameter, there's a number of if conditions, and depending on the, on the, on the incoming parameter, uh, I would only uh, execute something that calls a get date. That part is not inlineable. So although the entire UDF was potentially inlineable, the, the, the part of the UDF that I would be calling into this execution is not inlineable, so therefore we won't use it. So this decision is always made on a per query, per UDF basis, okay? So uh, uh, every example may, may be different there. Yes, and this would be the demo, and essentially concludes my, my, my presentation for today. So what, a challenge that I would, that I would like to, to throw at you is um, if you think, um, th so these are still in public preview because SQL for 19 hasn't launched yet, uh, and it's also in public preview in Azure. But if you, if you run through the demos or you start exploring intelligent query processing, and if you, if you see something that you don't think you should be seeing, please email us, we'd like to know. If you actually have ideas for other uh, problem, space, problem areas that you see that you would like us to try to handle automatically, please let us know what your scenario is. Uh, you, can, you can email that intelligentqp at microsoft.com. We're always looking for uh, suggestions and, and more scenarios. Um, if you want to try out SQL Server 2019, this is the short link right here, aka.msx.ss19. This is the download page. Um, these are the demos that, that uh, some of them we've, we've seen today and others I'm inviting you to go and, and look at. Um, some of the uh, features deal with known patterns and anti-patterns in SQL Server. If you want to learn more about what those are, uh, this is a shameless plug. I'm sorry about that. I've written a book about it, so feel free to, to go and take a look. And another one that I usually uh, call out is there's a lot of obscure areas of documentation in SQL Server, like uh, standards or, or DB compat level, like we talked today. There's a number of Sometimes it doesn't get easy to navigate the complexity of, of, of um, documentation that SQL Server has. So we've created a number of shortcuts that guide you to pivotal parts of the documentation that people often ask about. And we've gathered them all in this, uh, this, this shortcut. So I'm, like I'm saying here, it's one shortcut to rule them all. If you're a fan of the Lord of the Rings, that's, uh, that's uh, a call out to that. So just... If you keep this one in mind, you get to all, to all the others. Now, your book, T-SQL Querying, would that be uh, good for someone like, uh, and it was an ex developer wants to learn about T-SQL, or is it a more advanced topic? It's, it, it, it covers the basics of T-SQL, and then quickly takes you into how SQL Server deals with incoming T-SQL and transforms that into an actual execution and result set. And it also goes into all the, basically all the things that you need to avoid as a SQL developer to make sure you write queries that, that behave efficiently. So it's, I wouldn't say, it, it, it takes you from level 100 to 300 very quickly. Uh, but you already, if you already have notions of databases and how databases work and you do working with Access and, and with SQL Server with Access, it, it, I think it's 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 the appropriate uh, level. All right. 
So we're going to open up for questions here. Does anybody have any questions, comments about the presentation? You can either leave a comment in the chat or open your mic up and ask Pedro. I tried the SQL shortcuts, but I, I don't get it. I tried it and I did get it. Try it again. I just got into it. Sure you it does do. work. Yeah. yeah. Let me just open right here. It's it's uh, all old problem if your uh, language is German if you always get that shit uh, D E D instead of E N U S. It's right here. Yeah, but he's got he's getting a No, but it's that, that's not even the case because it goes to a GitHub page. Look at this. Yes. Okay. So make sure that you've uh, written it correctly and uh, it gets you here. So there's a number of. Uh, links and resources here yeah it's great we'll definitely go through that anybody else have a question Carlos? you have any, another question no at the moment thank you well, well i do have a question for you you know we do a lot of multi-tenant databases and uh in 2019 what is the preferred method of dealing with it uh, usually we use a udf function to separate the data you need to let me know more about the scenario. What do you mean you use the UDF? So for example, you have a franchise franchise system with like the subway subway franchisees. There's like a thousand subway subway franchisees. They're all using one database at corporate. Okay. So um, a so franchisee owner should only see his data in the database. And so we would uh, typically we would use set up a UDF, and when we create a query, we call the UDF so he. Can oh, I see what you mean. Yes. Well, you you can use you can use um, role level security actually. Uh, with role level security, um, you can define uh, roles, uh, which could be, for example, store A, B, C, whatever. And depending on the role, uh, you only the, the 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 underlying table is the same, but you only see the rows that you have access to. For example. Okay. Very nice. Uh, that that's one way of doing it, and that's also available in in SQL Server twenty seventeen, by the way. Level of security it is. All right. Uh, okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Pedro. Appreciate it. Uh, appreciate it a lot. And uh, we uh, will have this video recording live. We'll send you a link, Pedro. And so long, everybody. Next next month in uh, November, we're going to resume SQL Server Academy with the Intermediate. And we'll talk to you guys then. Thank you so much. So long.